Hello and welcome to your weekly update on what's happening in the world of science. Turning Point dedicates this episode to the rich history of Indian science and to our forefathers who through systematic observation and analytical reasoning paved the way for modern science and scientific spirit. Nearly a century ago, Lady Morgan, a woman of exquisite tastes, brought with her a number of exotic plants to Bengal. One of them soon came to be known as the Terror of Bengal. Our story shows how a once harmless ornamental plant in an alien surrounding could become a hydra-headed monster. This ornamental plant is the water hyacinth, or Icornia crassipis. A native of South America, water hyacinth today is the most gregariously growing aquatic weed in India, infesting an estimated water surface area of more than 200,000 hectares. Water hyacinth not only pollutes drinking water, but also causes serious disruption to aquatic life, provides suitable breeding ground for insect vectors, causes water loss through evapotranspiration and produces high rate of organic matter that leads to silting and gradual drying up of water bodies. The water hyacinth is capable of doubling its biomass every 10 days and this astounding growth rate is complemented by water pollution which provides adequate nutrients and the absence of their natural enemies which results in their unchecked proliferation. Chemical controls, like herbicides, though successful, are slowly being abandoned for reasons of environmental safety. In 1982, the Indian Institute of Horticultural Research, Bangalore, initiated biological control trials against the water hyacinth. In the natural undisturbed state, plants and the organisms that feed upon it remain in an equilibrium position. And in the case of water hyacinth, it's not a serious weed in its native home because it's kept under check by a number of uh, organisms, including insects. In India, water hyacinth is a serious problem, so we thought that we can get a situation as prevailing in its native home. Two weevils, Neocatina icornia and Neocatina brucai, and a mite, Orthogalumna terebrantis, were imported from the USA, tested positive for their host specificity, and released on the hyacinth. The adult weevils scrape and feed on the leaf laminae and lay their eggs below the petiole and the laminae. These are the larval feeding marks, which indicate the presence of the larva. On full growth, they emerge and pupate underwater, attached to the root of the plant. The mites feed on the scars left by the weevils. The female lays the eggs inside the leaf tissue and the young mites gradually grow in size, creating linear galleries in the lamina. Any method of control has an element of risk involved in it. In the case of biological control, there's this fear that after eating up water hyacinth, the insects that we introduce to control water hyacinth can become a pest on other crops. This cannot happen mainly because the, uh, the insects are host specific and they, cannot, they can multiply only on water hyacinth. These insects have brought about spectacular results in curbing the menace of the water hyacinth. But the finest example of the success of this biological control is the clearing of 75% of the Loktak Lake in Manipur covering an area of 286 square kilometers. Perhaps complete eradication of the water hyacinth may not be possible, but the biocontrol method, if successfully implemented, can ensure that it is no longer a menace, but a harmless member of our ecosystem. After made-to-order clothes and made-to-order food, will made-to-order babies be next? Yes, made-to-order babies. Today, Developments in genetic engineering have taken man so deep within himself that it would not at all be surprising 
if scientists of tomorrow were able to design babies, babies which were stronger, healthier and more resistant to disease. Amazed? So was I until I saw this story. Long before the genetic basis of heredity and the concept of made to order was understood, our farmers recognized that they could produce healthier offspring by selecting stronger and superior breeds of cattle as parents. In a sense, they were the pioneers, perhaps the first genetic engineers who tried to understand nature, the supreme gene surgeon. Today, with modern science, man is mounting an assault to study the supreme gene surgeon with the Human Genome Project, a multi-billion dollar program aimed at understanding the very working of human life. In general, humans are made up of a hundred trillion cells, each one containing a hundred thousand genes or segments of DNA. Organized into special varied patterns, these genes act as biological computer programs, carrying coded instructions to make proteins, the basic building blocks of life. Scientists believe that by mapping the location and subsequently studying the sequencing of all these hundred thousand genes, they might be able to, in the future, identify the nature of each and every gene, its functions and its role in the working of life itself. The possible implications of this project are fantastic. Tomorrow's babies could be more disease resistant than us. Genetic deformities and unwanted characteristics could easily be avoided and done away with. While scientists are struggling to understand the very nature and working of life, another group of genetic engineers are trying to alter and possibly improve the genomes of organisms by using the cloning technology. Very much a general practice in animal husbandry, scientists today are cloning or producing a number of genetically identical copies of cattle embryo to artificially reproduce superior breeds of cattle. But ironically, the next inevitable step that has taken humanity closer to the concept of super babies, the cloning of human embryos, has received the fiercest criticism. US scientists Jerry Hall and Robert Stillman took a giant step closer to designer babies by successfully replicating 17 human embryos to produce 48 clones. The implications are immense. Embryo clones could be frozen and used years later. In fact, the same child could be given birth to after every few years. Like it or not, designer babies, superhumans of tomorrow, are more than just a distant reality. How many of us bother to know or even think about what happens to the waste we throw out? Did you know? Thousands of tons of garbage is generated every day in our cities and towns. And what happens to this garbage? It's just dumped somewhere. Is that the final solution to waste disposal? Every day, 10 million Bombayites throw out more than 4,000 tons of garbage. And over 700 million metric tons per year of biodegradable waste is generated in India. With massive urbanization and industrialization over the past couple of decades, the issue of garbage disposal 
has attained serious dimensions today. Scientists in Bombay have come out with a cost-effective technology that can convert huge mountains of biodegradable waste into valuable bio-organic soil enrichers. We focused our attention about seven years back on finding a solution with the help of the nature's agent, that is the microbes. What we have done, we focused on selection of right type of the microbes, giving them proper working conditions with good nutritional diet for them, and making them work on unwanted waste material so that the degradation or the bioconversion pathways are speeded up. Years of painstaking research led to the discovery of a series of microorganisms that can accelerate fermentation in biodegradable waste. The lab process begins with the dilution of the soil sample. It is then put on a nutrient medium for microbes to grow. The microorganism is then isolated by streaking onto another nutrient agar for further growth. After identification, the microbe is inoculated in a jar, which is kept under ideal conditions for further multiplication. The field process starts with the preparation of the microbial slurry and sprayed on the garbage heap, where the exothermic reaction raises the heat temperature to 70 degrees Celsius. They are then let to ferment for 10 to 12 days. These reactions destroy all the noxious pathogens and remove the unpleasant smell. Finally, the decomposed material is separated and graded with machines. Wastes like metals, plastics and rubber are recovered and the process is usually completed in about six weeks. The bio-organic soil enricher is an odorless, rich, humus-like coarse material. Its direct manurial value is four to six times higher than that of cow dung. Furthermore, valuable chemical and biological ingredients make it a balanced plant food with soil rejuvenating properties. Conservation is the watchword in today's times, and bioconversion of organic waste is a major step towards a more environment-friendly world. With the recent tragedy of plague still fresh in the minds of people, it's extremely important to create awareness and to take proper steps towards effective waste disposal. <laughs> Hello. I was reading this magazine, but you must have also seen what kind of action I'm going through while turning the pages. This is connected with a letter which I received from Ranjit from Kanpur, who asks, when we turn pages of a book, it turns out that the page after that also is stuck with it and stays it with it. And we have to work hard to separate it. Why pages want to follow each other? The reason, of course, is that when two pages are close to each other and you want to separate them, you are trying to push air out and air has to go in between. And if the pages stay completely flat, it will be very difficult to separate them. So in the turning process, what you do is you twist the page a little bit at one end, you bend it around so that there is a pressure, there is a movement this way and page slips out. You somehow try to create a small opening for air to go in between the pages and then the pages separate. So it is the air pressure. You must have noticed also how people count uh, big bundles of currency notes. Wet their fingers, shouldn't wet them with the mouth, should wet it with a, <laughs> with a wet sponge or so on, and then go on doing this 
they have to create friction and go on twisting and turning the pages in order to allow air to go in. That's the answer. I'm not sick. This is because I got a letter from Rais Ahmed of Kanpur, who says, how can I take my temperature if the room temperature itself is 42 degrees? Because shaking of the thermometer won't bring the mercury down. What you do is, of course, you wash it in water, cool water, and then you shake it. While shaking, the water on the surface will evaporate and cool it down further. And as soon as the temperature is below 37 degrees, put it in your mouth, wait for a minute, a minute and a half, take it out, read quickly, and you got your temperature. India has a long and glorious tradition of herbal medicine. Today, with a major transition in favor of natural products, our traditional systems of medicine like Ayurveda, Siddha, Yunani, as well as the folk systems are coming to the forefront of medical research. So join Turning Point as we take a look at the medicinal prospects of the various herbs and plants which have cured India's sick and ailing for generations. Herbal drugs have been used for millennia in traditional system of medicine. Of the estimated 15,000 species of plants growing here, about 2,500 are used in various systems of medicine like Ayurveda, Siddha, Yunani and even homeopathy. Today, modern science recognizes their potential. The significance of this is even greater in a developing country like ours where the battle against epidemic and endemic diseases is not over. Today, not only ancient remedies are being revived, but newer compounds are being found from these very herbs for other diseases besides the ones we already know of. The CDRI at Lucknow is undertaking such research. Google, an age-old drug for obesity was extensively used in rituals too. Twenty years of arduous research bore fruit. Once again, Google proved itself as an effective drug for coronary heart disease and blood cholesterol. The Google resin is defatted, mixed in alcohol to obtain Google extract. This extract is separated from the solvent and concentrated. The concentrate is dried and made into capsules. Rita or soap nut is used as a mild natural detergent for centuries. A successful research has proved that it has the properties of contraceptive too. The cream acts as a vehicle for the extract for use with no side effects whatsoever. At the Central Institute of Medicinal and Aromatic Plants, a sister institute of CDRI, another drug is being developed the traditional Chinese plant King Hasu, or Artemisia annua, provides the material with medicinal properties. RT ether, the wonder drug, is in the final stage of clinical trials. This drug might prove to be a cure for a sometimes fatal type of malaria, known as falciparum malaria. Certain marine flora have been chosen for research too. In addition to them, we have picrolive, that's for liver disorders, and we are trying that drug in acute cases of viral hepatitis, as also in chronic carriers. The other lead is in Brahmi, that's for memory improvement, and is in phase one, that's the safety efficacy trials. Various centers around the world are undertaking comprehensive studies on herbs for modern drugs, and today, WHO is accepting these inexpensive herbs as a potential source for drugs, which could be a boon for developing countries. 